whale song being streamed from just, just offshore of the, the Kona coast of the big island of Hawaii. Um, and it's actually being captured and streamed live off of one of our, off of our robots that's um, wandering around in the ocean out there. Um, the, the, the Liquid Robotics got, got started back in 2005 um, when uh, a guy named Joe Rizzi, who has a house in, in, in Hawaii, and he could see the, the whale sort of jumping you know, outside his kitchen window, he was kind of wondering, you know, why can't I listen to them too? And being an engineer, um, he did the usual things of, you know, going out in a rowboat with a microphone and a long piece of wire and learning why that didn't work and all kinds of other little experiments. And um, somewhere along the line, he decided that what he needed was a sort of a radio controlled car for the ocean. Um, and you know, he brought in his friend Derek Hine, and then Derek brought in his son Roger Hine, and they came up with this rather strange robot to um, wander the ocean and carry initially the, this, this acoustic sensor out there. Um, and they did this as a, as a part of this, this, this foundation that Joe is involved with, something called the Jupiter Foundation. They're actually the ones that own the, the wave glider that's collecting the, the audio stream you're listening to right now. Uh, and if you go to jupiterfoundation.org during whale season in Hawaii, which is January, February, March, this of April, they almost always have a wave glider or two um, out off the coast, um, you know, some, somewhere around the Big Island or Maui, um, listening to the whales singing. And uh, right about now, there are a lot of whales. And it's a little quiet now because it's sort of the... The, the, the middle of the night there, um, and around about dawn it can get pretty exciting. But if you go to Jupiter Foundation anytime, you'll hear a live stream from, from, our, from our robot. So this isn't actually such a big change for me. Um, this is a, a picture of me and my, 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 my first job as a geek. I was, my mom says I was 14 in that picture, and I'm not sure I was, I might have been 15. Um, but I got this job working at the University of Calgary being a code monkey for a bunch of physicists um, who had some experiments on the ISIS-2 satellite. And for me, that was like more fun than anything I could imagine. Um, so now I'm back doing that. Here's some more, more pictures of the, 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 uh, the satellite I was, I was working with at the time. The picture in the top left corner is the, the satellite where you can see the the uh, photometer array, that sort of tube thing, that was the thing that I was taking the data streams off of and I was helping make the, the pictures at the bottom. And um, that's a great way to, 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 to learn how to program. And of course, the, the computer in this picture is a, is a PDP-8, which has less, less compute power than the smart card uh, in, inside the phone in your pocket. Um, you know, so these days, it's a very, very different world. Um, and the, ro the robots that we build are not your typical robot. Um, you know, people tend to think of robots as things that have arms and legs and, you know, laser cannons and um, the, whole not the whole nine yards. Um, our robots are kind of a surfboard with this weird thing that's, that sort of dangles below them that has all these little wings on them. Um, and and the, the surfboard, it's, it's kind of floating on the surface. It's being tossed around by the waves, and that's important because the waves make it move up and down. And there's a, there's a cable. This is in this photograph. This one was outfitted with a, a shorter than normal cable. Um, normally, they're about 7 meters or 21 feet. So the, 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 the float is, is, is in the waves, and the, 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 little wave, the, the, the wings are down in the calm part of the ocean. Um, and so here's a little picture of how it works. When the wave pulls the float up, the little rack of wings gets pulled up and they, they sort of rotate. And if you just sort of imagine, you know, dragging a wing through the water, it generates forward thrust. Then when the wave goes down, the little winged thing sort of descends and it, and it goes forward again. Um, one of the really important things about this is 
Um, there's no computer control in this, as this, as in this, 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 this thing. The, the, the little wings, they, they literally flop back and forth on hinges and they have springs and, um, they just respond naturally to the motion of the waves. Um, and they, they'll, they'll, they'll harvest energy from the waves 24 hours a day. Um, there, it's a really, really simple mechanism, which is uh, really important because it makes them very, very reliable. Um, there are some, some issues with it, so it's the motor that you can't turn off. You have absolutely no control over how fast the thing goes um, or, or whether or not the thing goes. It is always moving. So if you want to stop, you have to do donuts. If you want to slow down, you have to zigzag. And if you want to speed up, well, you've got a limit. Um, these things go about a knot and a half on a, on a good day. Um, we've got a n new one in the works that should go somewhat faster. Um, but being able to be out there 24 hours a day for long periods of time is a really, really valuable thing. So the, the, um, these devices are really platforms for sensors. We can put um, all kinds of things on them. There are we can put cameras on them, we can put uh, weather stations on them. These days we almost always put a weather station on them. Um, we can put um, th these things called Doppler velocity loggers or ADCP, adaptive Doppler current profilers that measure the speed of the water. There are sensors that measure wave height. There are sensors that measure all kinds of things about water chemistry. We can detect algae, we can detect crude oil, we can detect just crud. Uh, we can measure salinity. There are actually people that have sensors that you can put on these things that um, will actually do, do certain amounts of DNA sequencing. Um, we, can, we can measure just about anything you want, want to measure. Um, and of course, the, the, the only thing that we can mechanically move is this little thing down at the bottom this, this, this little, little square piece here, this little paddle, is actually the, the rudder. And that's the only thing that the computer can mechanically control, is the rudder. Um, and so we have to do everything around the guidance of the system just by big wiggling the rudder. Um, and, you know, so that, 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 that makes uh, navigation and such much simpler, because there's only one thing I could play with. Don't have to worry about 3D modeling and collision analysis of arms and all of that because they got no arms. Um, so, you know, life is easy, but life is hard. Um, it's interesting. So inside the float, there's a bunch of boxes that contain wires. There's a, um, there's a box in the middle that is the command and control unit. In the, the, the current generation of machines, it's a... Um, it's this very strange processor with only 64K of RAM. And the fact that it works at all, I find just, just amazing. Um, the next generation machine, the one that I'm, I'm working on, has got an, an ARM processor. And it's, you know, it's pretty much the guts of a cell phone, um, which means it's pretty deluxe. There's, there's lots and lots of room and lots and lots of compute power. And since you know don't have to do any graphics rendering, um, we're not, you know, showing movies to the fish or anything like that. Um, we've got lots of leftover compute power. Um, and then we've got these, these, these payload boxes that customers can put electronics for whatever sensors they want into. And then there are, you know, ways to, to wire things up so that you can put the, the sensor on the upper hull or down, down below on the, on the glider. Um, and there are also cables that go through the umbilical to talk to the, to the rudder module. And we do almost all of our communication uh, with the shore using the Iridium satellite network. Um, if we're really lucky and we happen to be close to shore, we can use uh, GSM, you know, the, the, the cell phone next network. Turns out we're almost never close enough to shore to use a cell phone network. Um, but if we can, we do, and certainly in our engineering site in, in Hawaii, that's what, that, that's what we do. Um, but one of the interesting slash painful issues with Iridium is that it's not cheap. So it runs about a dollar a kilobyte to, to move data. Um, 
which is not the what you guys are paying. Um, and you know, so you know, I really, really, really don't have a big data problem. Um, so here's our, our manufacturing shop. This is this is uh, where we build them, uh, which is um, just about 30 feet from where I'm sitting right now. Um, and there's a bunch of wave gliders that are in the process of being being built. Um, you can see their their uh, weather stations on top. The here are the solar cells. Here's a here's a glider rack being assembled. Um, here's a few more of them that are. They're getting ready to be to be shipped. The the black paint on these is is this paint that's got a bunch of copper in them. Uh, if they're going to be out in the ocean for for a really long way of, long, long time, we have to make sure that that um, um, all kinds of you know mollusks mollusks do not grow on them. Um, so it it, it, it it makes sure that, that the things like like limpets and such don't 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 start growing on them, which really slows them down and mucks them up. Um, but these things are really tough. You know, like I was saying earlier on, the, the, the design is really simple, so there are fewer things to fail. Um, they've been through like just incredible storms. Uh, this, th this year alone, we went through 14 hurricanes, um, or hurricane equivalents. You know, the, the, the word hur hurricane is a funny one because it only applies to storms in the Atlantic. Um, they're called, you know, you know, tropical cyclones or monsoons or typhoons, and they're all really the same thing, just in different oceans. So the the, the chart at the top here is a uh, is an event that happened uh, just to, just a, a few weeks ago. This this last New Year's, uh, one of our robots off the coast of Australia, just to the to the east of Australia, uh, kind of near New Caledonia, went through uh, Category Three. Um, so on the, on the left, there's this chart, the, the wind spiked at about, um, not, I think it was 91.7 knots. And then on the, on the right, um, you can see that this chart here is the, is the wave height and it, and it peaked just shy of 10 meters. Um, so a 10, 10 meter waves are, are, are 30 feet. Um, which is, this is certainly not the biggest storm we've been through, um, but, a, but it's a pretty recent one. And, you know, in, in storms like that, you know, ships just get out of there. Um, it's really interesting to look at plots of, of you know, the, the location of ships in the Gulf of Mexico in hurricane season because the, all the ships head for, head for port and, all of our little robots that are out there, they just stay there because they actually like waves. Uh, they do really well in waves. Um, and, and, and they're, you, people always ask about things like sharks. Do we get shark attacks? Well, we almost never get shark attacks. We've had two. One of them we hardly knew happened except we found um, a dent in a wing. Um, and then we had one that got fairly seriously mauled Here's its, its glider rack after it's been pulled out of the water. And you can see scratches all over the place. Um, and it was really big. The, the, these, these wings are, are fairly large. And for him to have been able to get his mouth on those wings and scratch deep down where he, where he did, this was a large shark. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at it, really all he ever did was just like scratch the paint. Here we've pulled one of the cables out of the out of the cable protector, um, but this little, little this little white triangle here that's a piece of tooth that was embedded in it, um, and we've taken that that tooth and taken it around to a bunch of shark experts, and nobody has a clue what it was, um, other than you know big and nasty. Um, but the but the glider came through the this this major shark mauling pretty much unscathed, uh, except that the, there was one place where that cable was unprotected, and you can see this little nick in the in this one rubber cable, um, and that unfortunately was the communication line to the rudder, um, so it was left drifting a couple hundred miles off the coast of Maui, and we had to go out and get it. Um, 
And so we redesigned and that one little piece of cable is now protected. Um, it's now inside something that's, that's reasonably safe from you know, giant shark chomps. So what do you do with these things? Um, they, do we use them for things like being a weather buoy? Um, here's one that's, that's um, actually doing donuts around a NOAA weather buoy. The, the little almost impossible to see white uh, baseball sized thing here is a weather station that has got most of the instruments that you see here. Um, and this one is actually just doing donuts around this weather buoy to, to, for, for, for calibration. Um, but unlike a, unlike a weather buoy, you don't have to you know, rent a ship for $100,000 a day to go out to the middle of the Atlantic to install it. You pretty literally just throw it off the end of a pier in deep water and it will swim itself out to the middle of the Atlantic and do donuts for a few months until it needs to be cleaned off and you like have it swim in and you scrub off the barnacles and it swims back out again. Um, they get used in the oil and gas business to do things like um, communicate with the various instruments that they have on the, on the, on the sea floor to do um, various kinds of monitoring around the, the, the drilling rigs to you know, measure things like water chemistry and such. Um, so here's, here's one um, in the Gulf of Mexico monitoring water chemistry around a, 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 an, an oil rig. Um, after the, the, the BP oil disaster, people got uh, really, really, really sensitive about uh, pollution. So um, that's been a good business for us. Um, also get used or are starting to get used for doing uh, marine mammal mo monitoring. There are all kinds of places where where people actually care about marine mammals. So like in the oil business, they're not allowed to do things that make really loud noises um, whenever there are marine mammals in the neighborhood. And these days, the, 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 the standard is to have a bunch of guys standing up on the, on the corners of the rig looking out in the ocean. And if they see something that looks maybe like a whale's tail, then they have to shut down. Uh, and they are looking for a better way to do that. So we're starting to help folks with that. Um, these things can be used as a picket fence around marine sanctuaries. We've been doing a number of trials about, around that. Um, we've, we've been involved in a whole bunch of, of global warming studies. Um, a while ago we, we did a, a large survey of, of ocean temperatures in the Arctic. Um, one of the nice things about our, our, our little guys is that they're much cheaper to, to send back and forth over a big swack of ocean. Um, and, um, you know, so, so we did this, did, did this uh, survey of, of Arctic um, water temperatures and the numbers that we got back are scary. Um, be scared. Um, we also get used, you know, depending on the sensor, you know, people can do things like, like uh, talk to um, underwater vehicles. Um, all kinds of weird seafloor sensors that you can get like, like tsunami detectors. Um, and occasionally they're used for public transportation. Um, this is this is one of our wave gliders. Um, this was just like a few days ago off the off the um, the northwest coast of Australia. Um, we don't get much problems with birds hitching rides, but yeah, it's always kind of sweet when they do. Um, we sometimes get questions about what happens when the when the bird craps on the solar panels and. Um, fortunately, the, 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 the waves wash the crap off pretty quickly. Um, they, they tend to be uh, you know, pretty clean. Um, so enough context. What am I doing? What am I up to? So I'm working on a pile of things, right? So I'm the chief software architect here. Um, so we're working on a next generation robot, which has more power and better hydrodynamics. It's actually got a thruster on it. Um, one of the interesting things, if you've spent much time around, around the ocean, um, there's sort of an inverse correlation between uh, sunshine and wave height. When it's really sunny, the, the waves tend to be pretty calm and, and, and vice versa. Um, so when the, when the waves are calm, we don't get as much uh, thrust out of the, 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 the wave racks as we can, as we would like. Normally, it's only a problem in the tropics, like in the Gulf of Mexico. 
um, but we are adding adding a thruster to it. Um, the really hard bits is that we've got customers that are talking about you know hundreds or thousands of wave gliders. So we currently don't have numbers like that. We've got a pretty decent number out there, but um, the way that they're operated right now, they have operators who um, actually pay attention to each one one at a time, and it's it's a real pain in the ass. Um, and so to you know, make them uh, be much more autonomous, be able to do things like dodge ships on their own without requiring human intervention. Um, that's what I'm what I'm doing. So the 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 onboard software is going to get much much more sophisticated. Um, so this is the the cart full of electronics that these days is occupying most of my life. Um, this is the the guts of a next generation wave glider all sort of pulled apart. And you see the, the arrow that's pointing to this little little uh, board here. That's, a, that's an ARM running uh, Java SE embedded on, on Linux. Uh, the Java SE embedded is a really, really lovely product. I'm so happy with it. It's, its performance has been great. Um, and with the, the, the latest not not yet FCS version of NetBeans, the 7.3 release. Um, I've been running the, the dailies of NetBeans, um, but the the the, um, the 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 latest NetBeans has got sort of special plugins for dealing with the uh, performance monitoring on the embedded um, on the embedded ARM VM, um, and so I can you know do performance monitoring actually on board the on board the robot as it flies. Um, it's really, really great. Um, you know, the, the, the state of the art for most people doing embedded programming these days is, you know, roughly VI. Um, and, you know, doing debugging in that is really, really tough. In the Java world, this stuff gets so much easier. Um, and uh, it's been fun working with a bunch of um, embedded systems engineers who are expecting this stuff to be hard and it just it just falls apart and becomes really, really easy. So these wave gliders really are part of you know a much larger network architecture, right? So we've got the wave gliders out here that have a network link through the Iridium satellite to a satellite ground station. The satellite ground station is redundantly sending packets to a couple of different data centers, and um, this is a really simplified diagram, but. Um, we have this 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 um, data cluster architecture that lets us, um, you know, keep a, you know an eventually consistent fault tolerant yada yada um, storage of all the samples that that, that 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 come off the wave gliders, and then these this this um, these data cluster nodes then feed a variety of web applications and desktop applications, and um, when I first got here, you know, when, when, I, when I was thinking about how to do these data cluster nodes, I was thinking about using, you know, any of the, 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 the usual NoSQL candidates. Um, but I kept bumping into ways in which, you know, this universe is just, just different um, between the, 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 the real paranoia about, about reliability and the fact that we don't actually have a whole lot of data. Uh, and the fact that we wanted to be able to slice and dice the data re repositories in kind of fine-grained ways, and we needed to have authentication. Um, so we need to be able to 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 to, to say who gets data, who get access, who gets access to what data when fairly precisely. So we we actually have authentication information on every data sample. You know, so we can do things like. Um, you know, sell the, 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 the data from the weather station, uh, the, the weather sensor on, you know, all the gliders in the Gulf of Mexico get sent to NOAA. And, and so the NOAA folks can securely see all the weather data, but they don't get to see the, the you know, the water chemistry data from the people who are doing oil prospecting. Uh, and it gets streamed back and forth. and. Then there are all kinds of issues about around where the data can physically reside, just because of you know between 
there are all these 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 these, these weird uh, data privacy rules that are much more contorted than the than the EU's privacy rules, and then and then the tax lawyers get involved. It's like you know you pay taxes on 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 data differently depending on where the data resides. And it's like oh lord, please. You know, anytime your network architecture is is affected by your tax accountants, just run. Um, so I ended up um, doing what was either like the stupidest thing I've done in years, or the the, the the most fun thing I've done in years, which is I built my own eventually consistent no no SQL data repository, um, and it's this streaming telemetry server, um, and it's so it's it's. You know, coefficient of reality is noticeably less than one, but it's 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 you know its vapor pressure is certainly greater than zero. We're using it you know actively every day, and I'd like to think it's a lot more reality than vapor, but um, who knows? Um, so none of it's really rocket science. It's it's you think of it as being kind of kind of a combination between um, Cassandra and JMS. Um, and it's it's really optimized for small things that flow. Um, it's not really. A, I mean, you, you can do blob store kind of things with it, but generally, when we need to do a blob store for like large audio files and that, we actually use the stream as indexes. Um, and every every chunk has has um, the opportunity to be individually authenticated. Um, and you know, if somebody's looking for a a, a general purpose streaming data system, this isn't it. Um, it's really, it's really, really optimized and really simple. So like I said, it's not a big data problem, right? It's, it's a dollar a kilobyte. Um, and at a you know, think about it, a dollar a kilobyte means, you know, you take, take the, the, the sort of standard disk drive you can buy for a desktop machine these days is about, about three terabytes. At three terabytes, it costs us Three billion dollars to fill one disk drive, right? So at the time we're we're just like finishing our first disk drive, we can afford to launch our own satellite constellation. Um, so not a big data problem. And actually, right now, you know, we can contain all of the data from all of the robots from the beginning of time, um, you know, on my laptop in RAM with lots of room to spare. So. Um, we just think about it differently, uh, but reliability is really, really crucial, um, and a lot the, the re reliability issues are somewhat variable. So, so for things like like scientific data, you know, they kind of need it eventually. They don't want to lose it, but they don't need need to have it right now. But for other stuff like um, like sensor information ar about ships in the neighborhood and most interestingly ships that might collide with the robot we care about that data you know minute by minute you know so uh, so a, 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 a 10 20 minute um, outage um, can end up with a, a a robot going through some big ships propellers and that's you know generally a bad thing um, you know so so failures in our in our system lead to fleets of flailing robots um, thank God they do not have laser cannons, um, and and authentication is a big piece of it, um, and we need to be able to do authentication on individual pieces. Our data model is really really simple. Uh, the the chunks of data that go through are just unique bags of bytes. They tend to be just a few hundred bytes a, bytes a piece, um, and and the the fact that they're unique is really really important, and they're. They tend to be made unique by the fact that each bag of bytes is, did, has got a, a, a timestamp and a lat long in them, and uh, you know a sensor type and all of that. But it, it means that that, for instance, to do duplicate suppression. So if you receive a packet from, you know, do duplicate packets from two places. You know, if if they look the same, they are the same, right? And you can just you can just throw it away. Um, and the total data is small, so we can afford to do. Um, a lot of redundant copies, just uh, just out of just out of paranoia. Um, so in this in this system, there are there are nodes. The nodes contain data. Um, the, the 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 nodes can publish their data to other nodes, and they can subscribe to 
to other nodes. Um, and the publish and subscribe mechanism has, as you know, when you when you subscribe, you express interests. Um, when you publish, you you authenticate, and really, it's the it's the intersection of the interests and authentication that 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 that, that determine what actually um, goes out in the in the, in the stream. And all you have to do is 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 connect a couple of of these publish subscribe links in either in either direction, and you've got nodes that are chatting and and hence replicating. And then you put a bunch of them together, and you've got a you've got a a, a mesh of nodes that are you know effectively staying staying consistent um and i do this sort of viral video echo echo cancellation so you know how you know viral videos work right? you know so, so somebody posts a a video of a sneezing panda and then folks you know send email to their five closest friends saying oh look at this crazy video and um and then folks just you know repost it to their friends and of course every now and then our friend says geez i've seen that that's boring and then they don't repost it. Um, so we just, I just, 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 just do this, this sort of flood replication. Um, and, and of course, there's, there's all kinds of subtlety for, for, for when a node goes down and then it comes back up again. It has to be able to say, well, what did I miss? Um, and it gets, it, it gets, gets kind of messy, but it, to, to a first approximation, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but it means that we've got all of these nodes that are um, from the outside world's point of view, absolutely identical. So you, you can subscribe to any of them and you will see the same, the same data stream. Um, and, um, and also you can uh, put these in lots of different data centers. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the issues with hosting providers is that um, you know, they, they not only have like individual machine failures, but whole data centers can fail and if the, the hosting provider has a software bug in their, you know, whatever, or they, they fat finger some configuration problem, you can lose a whole hosting provider. Um, so I'm actually running, running cluster nodes in, in, um, in three ISPs right now um, at GoGrid at a, at, a, at a nice little boutique one that I like called Entic, and then with the folks at, at J Elastic who's a, a really nice sort of uh, Java web app hosting, hosting outfit. Um, and, you know, I've been very, very careful to not use any of the ISP special APIs, right? So if you go to Amazon, there's all kinds of really cool Amazon APIs, and I just don't use any of them because um, that's kind of what, what works if you want to span, span different data centers. Um, and you know, in truth, the, 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 the kind of APIs that most of these folks have aren't terribly useful to me. Um, so I would just, just keep it simple. I can spread it all over the place. And one of the interesting side effects is that if we ever got hit by a, a, a denial of service attack, um, being on multiple data centers, being able to move from data center to data center pretty easily actually makes that much more straightforward. Um, also, when, when all the nodes in the cluster are essentially mirrors of each other, then applications that are really paranoid can actually subscribe to the same stream, but from multiple, multiple sources. And since you know, pa packets that look the same are the same, I can do cancellation really easily. So when they, the, the app just does duplicate um, uh, sub subscriptions to multiple hosts in the in in the cluster, and then if, uh, if 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 nodes go down, the app doesn't even notice that there's been a failure. There's no interruption in the data stream, and uh, another interesting little side effect is that the app gets the data through whatever the fastest path is. Um, you know, so that so that if there are you know not not just local failures but local sort of timing bumps, the the, the packets get through the network pretty pretty quickly. Um, so that that helps a lot. So you you can also take clusters and treat them as nodes, um, and then you can use cluster to cluster links with different filters, and we use that for delivering to customer private data centers. Um, there are all kinds of jurisdictional issues that we use for slicing the, slicing up the, the, the data. Uh, boy, I'm going to skip this slide. That's a long talk. Uh, I think I've already talked about authentication mostly. 
Uh, we use OpenAM and OpenDS. Um, for any of you who don't know what those are, those are the, the, the Sun of, of um, the Sun Identity Manager. It's a, when, we, when Sun turned them into open source projects. Um, and they're now actually being looked after by a, an, an interesting um, Norwegian company named ForgeRock. It's a, largely a bunch of ex-Sun employees who, who took the, 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 the Sun uh, authentication products and, um, and ran with them after, after Oracle canceled them. Um, really, really nice way to do authentication. Um, so another rat, rat hole is, is so, sort of doing the autonomous navigation. Um, it's a much easier problem for us because it's a 2D problem. There's only one actuator. The robot actually knows where it is and it can communicate with the shore and it moves, moves pretty slowly. It is also somewhat harder because these things have to collaborate and interact with each other and be out there for a long time and they're way out at sea, so we tend to be really par paranoid. If something goes wrong and you're in the middle of the, the North Pacific gyre, where you're like thousands of miles from anything, if something goes wrong, then you just write off the robot because it, it costs you know $150,000 a day to rent a boat to go out there. Um, you're talking at least 20 days back and forth to, to fetch it, three million dollars for for a repair run, not going to happen. Um, so we get really paranoid. And one of my points of inspiration is this little gizmo here. Um, the the guy on it is is a, a drinking buddy of mine from grad school named Mark Donner. This was his uh, thesis project. Um, and at the time, people were doing all these walking machines that had supercomputers on them. And, 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 and Mark, um, you know, and this was influenced by significant amounts of beer, sort of noticed one, one evening that, you know, cockroaches, uh, they have six legs, they can walk, they don't have supercomputers on board. So he spent a lot of time reading the, 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 the literature on the, the neural structure of cockroaches and found out all kinds of interesting things. And he actually built a programming language that was around being able to implement uh, neural net, well, neural algorithms, not neural nets, but kind of the way that, that, that the, the neural pathways in things like cockroaches sort of collaborate to move stuff. And, and really the, 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 the way it ends up working is it's really, really simple. And what looks like complexity is, you know, what people call emergent behavior. Um, so the navigation system that I that I've built that sort of the, the the first pass is one that um, it's kind of like ants. So this is a this is a simulation that shows um, three three wave gliders that are all heading towards this um, this goal here, the green dot, and this this red dot is is something that they're trying to stay around. So they just get there and they just go around it. Um, and here's one that's, you know, one of the tasks that we get asked to do is things that are like picket fences around things like marine sanctuaries. So here's, you know, a bunch of um, robots being dropped in the water and they guide themselves out to this, this formation. Um, here's the same thing, only we've dropped the robots in different places. Um, when, the, when the fifth one joins, you see the, 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 the picket fence, uh, it sort of reshapes itself. Um, Here's kind of the, the same thing. It's, you know, four join and then a ship comes through and this, this one in the middle, if you watch it, it, um, it's, it's dodging a ship. Um, so this is all running nicely in simulation and what I'm doing right now is um, trying to get it to be um, actually in the ocean. And uh, um, so sometime in, sometime in April, um, and actually the big problem right now is that the gliders that can run this are mechanically not there yet. Um, and this, and the, the, the algorithm behind this is really, really simple. It's just these set of, of three goals, you know, the fence is good, avoid each other, avoid obstacles, duh. Um, and then the, all the, all the complexity sort of emerges and you can see how they um, they have these really wiggly paths because they can't actually stop. If they need to slow down, they just, they just sort of like zigzag. 
and when they need, need to stop, they just do donuts. Um, so thanks. Um, that's sort of the one through, run through of what I've been up to. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, all right. Thanks very much, James, for the presentation. So what we're going to do now is we'll take a few questions from the audience here. And um, this is hooked up via Skype to the room where James is presenting from. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll hop up and um, pop up here to give you the mic so you can ask it yourself. And otherwise, we have one or two questions from folks who are watching online, which we can also toss out. But you guys, you guys actually made an effort to come here in person. So you guys get the first, first dip of questions for Gosling. Anyone? You, you, you guys are shy about... Oh, come on. It's not that late. Yeah, my my question um, would be if the robots you said you expand and if they are sort of um, broken. Um, how do you feel about the littering of the sea? I mean, you, you put something out there and it's broken and then you just abandon it. Well, we try really hard to not do that. Um, you know, how much this might contribute to the littering of the ocean. Um, it's, it's, it's completely microscopic compared to, um, you, know, you, you, you know, one ship lost is, you know, hundreds of thousands of our little, little, little gliders. And I'd like to think we do a lot more good than harm. Um, and we've only ever abandoned one. We actually haven't completely abandoned it. It, it, it lost its, its, uh, its glider unit, um, but it's reporting in and it's drifting around in the North Pacific gyre. So we know where it is. It's just, you know, $3 million to go get it. And if it happens to drift close to something that we can go out and get it from, then we'll go do it. Um, well, you know, we, 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 we can't do, you know, certainly at 100,000, we would have swamped the, the Iridium network completely. Um, I don't know how many the Iridium network could support, but, um, you know, tragically, it's not a very big number. Um, but there are people that are trying to put up um, replacements to, to Iridium. Um, and, and a lot depends on, on you know, for, for the numbers of them, a lot depends on, on who you're talking to and what the applications are, you know. So, so folks like, like the, uh, the, the folks who do weather predictions, you know, in their rich fantasy life, they would like to have thousands out there. Um, there are folks that would like to do, like, um, monitoring of, of, of fishing grounds to, to, uh, to block poachers and you know that would take thousands more um, you know if we just you know had a couple for every um, you know, um, oil, oil drilling platform out there to, to measure the water chemistry around them you know that would be probably 10,000 
you know, the, the numbers rack up pretty quickly and a lot of these uses are actually pretty important. Um, it's it's in the data nodes currently, um, and I was so it's it's the, the the way that the interior architecture on board the wave glider is going. It's pretty clear that the wave glider actually has to have um, caches of the authentication database or parts of the authentication database because. Um, in the very near future, like this month or next, um, we'll be able to drop in sort of the, sort of the equivalent of a servlet, um, so that the, that the, the, the customer can drop in a piece of, of analysis software. Um, and then we do the, the, the full sort of security encapsulation around it and get it, you know, give it access to the stuff that it's allowed to have access to. Um, on board the wave glider. Um, there's a number of our sensors where um, we really want to do data reduction on board the, the wave glider. Um, so, you know, for, for example, um, people doing marine mammal monitoring, um, it's crazy to move uh, an audio stream back to shore at, you know, a dollar a kilobyte. Um, instead, what you want to do is do the audio analysis on board the vehicle and then, then just send a message that says, Hi, I found a narwhal here. Um, and we're um, not quite there yet, but it's, it's on the very near to-do list. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me, and um, you know the the Java end-to-end -end story has been a, a pretty interesting one, um, and I'm I'm really having a great time doing a fairly extreme version of end-to-end. -end. Thanks. Thanks.